Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar titled, Let's Talk About Parenting, Telling a New Story to Better Influence Policy. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of, uh, of the land upon which all participants of this webinar stand and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Today, we'll, we will be hearing from Annette Michaud, Director of the Parenting Research Centre. Annette has over 20 years of experience in child and family practice, policy and research management. Over her career, she has been General Manager, Social Policy and Research at the Benevolent Society, CEO of the New South Wales Child Protection Council, a Senior Policymaker at the New South Wales Commission for Children and Young People, and she's worked in frontline child welfare and community development in the UK and Australia. With a clear understanding of the art and science of parenting, an insight into how governments work, Annette will today help us understand how we can all tell a new story to better influence policy. Annette, over to you, thank you. It's great to be here today. Thank you so much uh, for coming to this webinar. Um, I'm going to present some incredibly exciting research uh, on free-framing parenting. So this is a really compelling story and I'm really glad you can join me here today. So I just want to firstly acknowledge the authors of this research and indeed the, the, the people who put this presentation together with me, uh, Nat Kendall-Taylor and Emily Lutz from the uh, Frameworks Institute and also partners on this project, the Australian Government Department of Social Services, the Victorian Department of Education and Training, New South Wales Government Department of Family and Community Services, and last but not least, the Benevolent Society. At the Parenting Research Centre, our mission is to help children thrive by finding new and better ways to support families in their parenting. So this project was very exciting given our mission and many of you on the line now uh, have worked with us both in government and NGOs to bring the science of parenting together with practice, the voices of children and families and policy. At the Parenting Research Centre, we work um, in a variety of practice areas. So I'll very briefly just mention a couple of areas where you might, uh, where you might know us. Uh, we do a lot of knowledge translation work and a lot of that works through the Raising Children Network. Uh, we do practice design and implementation work. Um, examples of that are uh, in the implementation space, Safe Care in New South Wales and design and implementation of Small Talk in Victoria. And we also do evaluation and research work. We recently, on behalf of the Queensland Government, evaluated the new um, intensive family services in Queensland. So that's just by way of introduction to who we are, in case you haven't come across us before. But looking at the list of participants, I know that um, many of you are familiar with our work and also have been introduced to the Frameworks work before. So I'm talking today about reframing parenting and really going through about seven strategies to win hearts and minds so we can much more effectively communicate about parenting in Australia. As, as you know, as sector people on the phone, the science of parenting is building uh, and we know that parenting is centrally important to anyone working with children or thinking about family policy because effective parenting uh, is so central to child outcomes. Uh, now, members of the public and almost everybody agrees that good parenting is important, but few agree on exactly what it is, especially in this time of changing gender roles, family structures, new technology, and the fluidity around norms and expectations. And really interestingly, this research actually tells us that people actually bristle they bristle at the notion of good parenting itself. And this means they're resisting messages they perceive as instructing parents to behave in certain ways. Um, parenting experts or people in the sector who understand parenting have really coalesced around a set of parenting practices that research shows promote children's development and well-being and reduce social disparities. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a mismatch there. So Frameworks has conducted research into how best to communicate expert views with the public to deepen understanding of effective evidence-based practices and build support for parenting programs and policies. 
So in summary, uh, just before I go on, the Australian public does absolutely recognise the importance of parenting, but few Australians are aware of the science behind it or understand how systemic solutions can improve outcomes for children and communities. This research, though, gives us concrete and immediately usable strategies for communicating more effectively about parenting. So what I'm going to talk about today is why think about framing, why is that important, and give you some hows, how we can actually reframe parenting. So give you insights into both these things. And the first reason why we need to think about framing is because sustained social change actually requires culture change. Another way of saying this is that if we want to address social issues, we actually have to start addressing public thinking. Uh, the left-hand side of this, and apologies, that's all meant to be arrows, just ignore the ones and the t's, but the left-hand side of this slide is really what's happening now as a sector, we're tending to talk at cross purposes and without a common message about parenting. Um, but if we want to change and, and have an effective master narrative, our communications can be aligned um, and can dislodge unproductive thinking about parenting. So this project actually helps us shift to the right hand side. So we're all starting to sing from the same song sheet. So that's the number one reason. The second reason why we need to think about framing is because we absolutely have a problem in our communications. Uh, when we talk uh, in the sector and to our colleagues, uh, the way we talk about parenting is we tend to agree. We tend to have some strong and persuasive arguments. When we take these arguments out to the public, though, they tend to think uh, about things a bit differently. So our, what we say leads people to think in a different way to what we're saying. So this work unpacks why that is and how we can get people to think more productively. And in the words of JFK, I think this really captures this issue that we're confronting. The great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive and unrealistic. So, so now I want to move to the seven uh, strategies and just to give you a heads up about the two parts to the research. Um, the first and the cornerstone was undertaken in 2015 and mapped the gaps between uh, the expert understanding of parenting and the science of parenting versus what the public thinks. And the second piece gives us a guide to effectively talking about parenting by empirically testing some more effective ways of talking about parenting and coming with, up with some research-based communication tools. Uh, over the course of this research, which actually started um, with the Centre for Community Child Health developing some strategies around the early childhood story. More than 15,000 Australians have been involved and we've, uh, frameworks have used a mixed methodology and I'll be talking about that throughout this talk and we can come back to that in the questions. Um, but just to really state that it's quite a rigorous and robust approach to designing effective approaches to communicating about parenting. I'm just saying this is a foundation because what we found here really does count and should now influence any of you who want to get better support for your work with children and families. And it moves from in-depth qualitative uh, interviews with individuals about their views on parenting right through to experiment, large uh, survey experiments to test new ways of communicating about parenting. So the first strategy is really to understand what you're up against when you're communicating and to get more strategic. And this was really about mapping the gaps. Um, in that first period of research, um, the Frameworks Institute interviewed experts and reviewed the literature to understand the science of parenting and common themes. This gave us what the Frameworks Institute calls the untranslated expert story of Parenting Australia, the set of key themes that we're trying to communicate about parenting to those who don't actually have expertise in the space. 
Frameworks then conducted what they call cultural models interviews with the public. And this consisted of 50-odd uh, in-depth interviews to uncover those deeply held views and ways of thinking about parenting. This gave us really important messages to advance and messages to avoid about parenting. And so that's what we mean about getting strategic. Coming back to that slide I showed earlier, um, what we say, you know, we really, we can be very passionate about parenting and the parenting can be learned and the skills and capacities parents need, um, what parents need to improve to become more effective. And we're very passionately advocating this message. And what could possibly go wrong with that? Well, a lot. <laughs> and that's because of uh, this big bubble in the centre culture. The public brings a very rich set of cultural models, uh, widely shared but implicit ways of thinking and talking about parenting. And these models actually get in the way of us advancing our key evidence-based um, thinking about parenting support. So just as a reminder, when, when we as people in this space think about effective parenting, we know it's shaped by a multiplicity of factors and involves meeting the physical, emotional, cognitive needs of children and involves this incredible interaction where we stimulate and nurture children so that they develop into skilled, self-reliant and empathic children and adults who can relate well to others. And not only that, but it's shaped by a lot of external factors from family of origin to where you live, the infrastructure around you and the policies and services available in your context that can either support or make parenting much harder. So experts talk about the kind of eco-cultural understanding of context and that parenting is contingent upon what's around it. So yes, it's about skills and capacities, but those skills and capacities are set in these uh, dimensions of um, the, the context around which parents are raising children. And we really need to look at both the broader context and what needs to change and be improved and parenting skills. On the other hand, the cultural models held by members of the public, and this came out of those interviews, um, were things like individualism, determinism, um, and uh, issues around gender. I'll just pick out a couple of those areas um, to talk about today. So when we talked to um, sure. members of the public and un to understand those cultural models, people see parenting as just about caring, that it's an innate thing and just comes naturally. This has two powerful effects. Um, those who are not seen as able to do this are seen as unnatural and bad. It also makes it very easy to vilify parents who are struggling. It's also very, very deterministic. If this just comes natural, it means it's very hard to change. The second big gap is that determinism gap where um, one of the big cultural models is around um, people seeing parenting as mostly and most deeply affected by how you were parented. Um, so experts see a kind of multifaceted uh, dynamic impacting on parenting, whereas the public just sees how you were parented as what's going to impact on you. So there's not a lot of room to think more broadly about supporting that. Finally, I'll just mention the models of government because I know there's people from government on the end of the on the on the line. Um, there were three very powerful models, two quite negative, but one incredibly constructive one. So there was one as government as big brother and not only providing advice, top down advice, but it being inaccurate and bad. But a third model was about government as a partner and people there's, there's a productive way of thinking that we can certainly activate around government, that government is a partner and it does assist by providing all important services. So that's the first thing we need to understand. Uh, be strategic and understand what to advance and avoid. The second part of uh, this, this research 
and we moved from ma mapping the gaps into the next phase was um, around understanding a new and more effective narrative. So the second key point is to change the big idea. A quite sophisticated methodology was used by frameworks to design candidate metaphors and frames. So they make basically stories and empirically testing them with over 7,000 Australians, followed by persistence trials to check that people were able to tell the story to others without losing some of those key messages. What we know is that changing culture and reshaping policy requires a big idea or master narrative that actually helps change how people think and what they see as important. This master narrative tells an audience what an issue is about, why it matters, what will happen if action isn't taken and what actually needs to be done. So identifying this narrative is really crucial for attempting to change public thinking and move policy. And fantastically in this research, um, we came up with a very powerful uh, new master narrative. So at the moment, a common narrative is to focus on why supporting better parenting matters. This involves talking about improving parenting, making parenting more effective. That's on the left-hand side of the slide. On the right-hand side of the slide is another strategy to move from an effective parenting frame to a child development frame. And this child development frame significantly wins hearts and minds to actually supporting uh, effective parenting. So without this framing, people are unlikely to support our work. But with this framing, the research is showing that they are quite very likely to support our work. So just to be a bit more concrete, what does this reframe actually look like? Well, on the left, it's from we need to invest in programs that support effective parenting to talking firstly about child developments. For example, to raise healthy and thriving children, Australia's parents need support. Another example is from our own, our own website. So the Parenting Research Centre, we used to say, before we got this research, we said effective parenting builds futures. Now we're saying, we help children thrive by finding new and better ways to support families in their parenting. It grounds the conversation in what effective parenting is really for, that's healthy, thriving children. And this slide just gives you a background to the, um, the experimental trial we, uh, that the Frameworks Institute ran. And it, gives the t it shows you the two master narratives at work. Um, and we, you can see that they have dramatically divergent effects. So the ones above the line in orange are good and they're the child development frame and below the line um, we have the effective parenting frame. So the child development master frame was really effective leading to large statistically significant gains in support for the parenting initiative that we talked about uh, in the research, as well as increases for more specific policies such as making childcare free or publicly funded parenting centres. So coming from that frame elicited <laughs> significant public support. But on the other side, on the negative side, the effective parenting master frame resulted in a statistically significant decrease in people's support for the initiative. Similarly, when we asked questions about people's behaviour, willingness to pay additional taxes or engage in civic action uh, in their communities, using the child development master frame, people were very supportive um, using the parenting support frame leading to a decrease in people being willing to um, pay more taxes or engage in civic action. So what frameworks were telling us from this research that, that when they have a very, very significant um, master frame here that's very effective to use, which is terrific news for us. So the third strategy is really uh, going back to those avoid messages, for us to make sure we're not inadvertently judging or evaluating parents and parenting. So 
the research is showing us that people actually discount or even reject our messages about parenting when we use terms like good parenting, effective parenting and improving parenting. Well, why is this? Well, because that sort of language actually hardens people's at, uh, ideas that parenting is highly subjective, that every child and uh, family is different, that parenting is innate and therefore can't be improved. So if we talk about those things, it sends people back into that corner and we don't want that. Language that evaluates parenting or appears to be commenting on good or bad should be avoided. And this is just an example of a kind of less obvious but still quite judgy piece of uh, parenting advice from a parenting website. In the green, you can see um, uh, framing using good and bad parenting that we now know is likely to actually get people to tune out. And I'll just read the first bit. The sign of a good parent is not that you have enrolled your baby in every activity that's available in your local area. Being a good parent is about spending time with your baby. On the other side, we're now starting, you can see it from that child development frame, starting with the child. And it starts off early on, the experiences that children have lay the foundations for their developing brain. And parents are an important part of this process. Then it goes on to say what you can actually do. So quite subtle but quite significant as an example of that reframing. The fourth strategy is to use metaphor to provide a mental image that sticks and shifts. Um, metaphors really help people see that parenting is affected by context and is not completely innate or natural. We really need to move people away from this frame. Um, so what's happening at the moment is people don't have a structure in which to see how parenting is affected by the social context, uh, the economic state, um, and how this really shapes ability to parent. So in order to tell a more effective story and to help the public understand the multifaceted nature of raising children, um, the explanatory metaphors compare uh, an idea uh, that is not well understood with a familiar process. So that's what a metaphor really helps us do. Strong metaphors are memorable, which makes them effective uh, framing tools that, because they're contagious, they can be passed from person to person easily. Uh, and Frameworks tested a number of metaphors. We had about six or seven in street interviews and then through the large scale survey experiment and then through persistence trials. Uh, and I hope you can all hear me this time, but this slide goes through the navigating metaphor. I'll just very briefly run through it. The first part is about uh, raising children being like sailing on open water uh, and navigating through open water. Things like health problems can come along and make those waters choppy and hard to navigate. But we can build lighthouses and safe harbours um, like counselling services and childcare. Um, and these things offer safety and protection during hard times. So that's how the metaphor works. It helps people understand that parenting happens in context. And you can also see it helps people think about solutions. Um, there's three key components, raising children, it's like navigating, challenges are the rough choppy waters and supports the lighthouses and safe harbours that everybody can use. And it, does this strategic redirect away from individual individualism, natural parenting and fatalism. It was a very powerful net metaphor and really helped people see those solutions. So moving on to the next slide, the, the fifth strategy is that order is really important. So changing the conversation about parenting and advancing policies means we do still need to talk about specific skills, capacity, capacities and practices. But what the research is telling us is that order is everything. So doing this in a particular order will be able to get our message across and still talk about parenting and parenting skills, uh, but also avoid unproductive ways of thinking. So it's a good idea to start the conversation with setting the scene around the master narrative about children developing healthily and they need life to stay on an even, even keel. So that's the first thing, the child development uh, area. <coughs> the, the navigating metaphor really helps people understand how to help parents reach their destination. 
And after queuing for those external influences on parenting, people are less judgy and more likely to be able to think about parenting as something that can be learned. They can understand and relate to the supports that are needed. So again, an example of this, of how effective parenting, the top arrow, and what that triggers. So if we lead with effective parenting or parenting advice or parenting groups, that triggers parenting coming naturally and it triggers that blaming or even people rejecting our message. If we lead with that wider context around child development and raising thriving children being all important, it really helps cue uh, what around us shapes us and helps people understand that parenting is contingent and there's a need for support. So child development, the navigating that metaphor really helps people understand context. The sixth strategy is around um, show, don't tell, and trying to explain child development in ways that are really help, much more helpful for people. And uh, the Australian public does have a really good understanding of early childhood being an important period in children's lives. But they struggle to talk about how it actually happens and how development, how developmental outcomes can be improved. So what Frameworks has found when faced with explaining how child development happens, people tend to fall back on understanding child children as developing kind of automatically following natural trajectories of growth, rather than understanding the dynamic nature of rearing children. So showing that arrow in the middle talks about, well, how can we show the way it works? And the brain architecture metaphor that I know many of you are familiar with, uh, talking about brains not just being born but being built, is a very useful way of showing the public how. We've got two metaphors that were tested in Australia in 2014, the brain architecture metaphor and the serve and return metaphor. Um, and we suggest using these again to help people understand uh, skills and experience. So the brain architecture metaphor really helps people understand and move people towards the active dynamic process and the importance <coughs> of interacting with children, as does the serve and return metaphor, with brains being built through that back and forth serve and return interaction. They're very powerful in helping people move people's thinking to a more dynamic and solution focused uh, way of interacting with children and the kind of things that might get in the way of that as well. So the seventh strategy is really bringing this all together to say that we do really need to tell a new master narrative and we've got a very strong story now to use in our communications, on our websites uh, and in our communications with, with families even. Um, so starting on the left hand side, this narrative arc is about the big idea, it's about the health and development of children and how to help parents supporting this development. How does this work and what threatens it? The navigation metaphor, that navigation is essential and waters can get rough and we need supports as like safe harbours and lighthouses when that water gets choppy and that really helps people understand context and come up with solutions. And over on the right hand side, what do we need to do? We need to give parents what they need so that kids get what they need and that's all about that support. And at the bottom of the diagram we have the brain architecture and serve and return metaphors to also help us explain how child development works. So just to go through those seven strategies in summary, understand what you're up against and get the strategic. Uh, I've mentioned a few of the the uh, advance and avoid messages, but the toolkit on our website uh, goes through a whole list of eight, uh, eight messages to avoid and things to advance. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely set the big idea around child development, uh, reduce the way we talk about uh, effective parenting and really talk about child development as the big idea. Thirdly, don't judge and avoid evaluation. Uh, fourthly, provide a mental image that sticks and use that navigating waters metaphor. Order is everything, starting with <coughs> child development, uh, moving across that narrative arc 
And then uh, using the show, don't tell, the brain architecture and serve and return um, metaphors are really useful. And then tell the new tell the new master narrative. As I said, you can go to our website. We've got the two research reports, the map the gap report and the message memo, which is the second part of the research in summary. And we've got some concrete tools that you can use. Just wanted at the end of this to re-acknowledge the partners who made this project happen and also acknowledge the power of bringing people together on a project like this to really advance people's thinking. So thank you so much to the partners. Um, next steps are we're really interested in finding ways of implementing this uh, and practicing this new uh, way of communicating with a core group of people. So please do get in touch with us if you're interested in, in being part of this movement. And please do show us your initial efforts in reframing as well. I know some of you have already been doing that and it's fantastic to be able to share those. And finally, please do contact us and stay in touch. So thank you so much. I'll hand back to Paul now for our question session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a communications manager, that is a very pleasing presentation for me to see. That's fantastic. What we do, as all sectors do, is get bogged down with process stories rather than outcome stories and get bogged down with jargon rather than um, what I like to call Joe's six-pack language. And it's really important that we remember who our audiences are. When we, you know, the politicians who control the purse strings don't understand you know, parenting theory and they're not researchers, they're ordinary people. And, um, couch it in terms that they can understand. We also need to talk about outcomes, particularly again to politicians and policy makers because they're accountable for the money that they, they spend. So I think that's really good. And I was also very taken with the idea that parenting, uh, it, it's, it's very important not to place values on parents um, that, that somehow they don't have this mythical innate uh, parenting genius that they're somehow defective. It's a skill to be learned like any other skill. And, um, and a lack of education is not not the fault of someone who hasn't been given an education. Effectively. So really good stuff, very supportive. Now, I think we're waiting for some questions to come through. Um, I, th I think there's, I think the audience is still absorbing it all, Annette, to be honest. <laughs> Great, well, there, there is a lot to absorb. Yeah. We're up. Um, as you may be aware, we're very, very focused on the issue of parent engagement at school, at the school level, um, throughout school, and we're looking more and more um, in the area of uh, the transition, how parents are involved in their school and indeed local employers and so on, with helping be part of a partnership that helps young people make decisions about their next stage in life. I'm just wondering if any of the survey work you've done uh, as part of this work has touched on that area of parent engagement in school education, and it may not have, but if it did, is there anything you can talk to us about that? Yeah, look, um, uh, firstly, I'll just mention, um, uh, in terms of this research, I think it does give uh, school leaders and people interested in parental engagement some new and improved ways of trying to draw in the school community. Um, so it absolutely tells us to leverage that master narrative around, you know, we all want to raise thriving children. We're in this together. We really want to, you, you are the most important people in your children's lives. We want to hear from you. So again, starting with this being about thriving children uh, in our parental engagement work and turning our messages around there, I think, is really important. So I think in the frameworks work, there are some key messages there around school engagement that could, could be very useful at the community level. Uh, in terms of other surveys, um, the Parenting Research Centre actually just did a large survey of um, parents in Victoria and um, it's going to be repeated early next year. It was funded by the Department of Education and Training in Victoria. And the results of that are on our website, but there's some really interesting stuff about how uh, the extent to which parents in Victoria value um, teachers. After doctors, teachers are the most 
common person that parents go to to talk to about their children. And I think it was about 80% satisfaction with the advice that um, teachers give parents around issues with, with their children and their children's education. So the school community is the most powerful and well-regarded place. There's obviously room for improvement. There's a number of parents who aren't feeling like that, but we have a fantastic tool there. And it's possibly about schools where we feel um, parents might be less engaged. How do we how do we leverage this knowledge to engage parents who might be less engaged? So I think we've got a really solid base of trust in our school community and, and also in the early childhood sector as well. Thank you, Annette. Now, uh, in the time it took for me to formulate that question and for you to answer it, we now have a flood of questions. So look, I'll just start, I'll just start at the top, and we'll and we'll get cracking as best we can. And and for those in the audience, we'll answer as many as we can, and we'll take the rest on notice and answer them as best we can um, in the coming week or so. But the first one, which I think is really good, you talked about a, a lot of what to steer towards. That we've got a question from Michael, which is, uh, what were some of the failed metaphors? You were talking about the metaphors. Are you able to give some some people some rocks they should avoid in those waters? <laughs> yeah. Look, um, I was. There, there were failed metaphors, so if I talk about them, you're not allowed to remember them and then use them by mistake. That's the first thing. Um, one I was quite attached to was um, parenting uh, being like an art, uh, like learning how to paint or an art. It takes practice and it takes skill. And I thought that one was a fantastic one because it, it really, it really emphasised practice and skill. But the problem was it was was it kept redirecting people towards that individualistic view of parenting and one of the things we really needed to do was help people understand it's not just about skills there's this parenting is contingent upon what happens around it so it really reinforced this very kind of individualistic uh, met, uh, approach to parenting so that was an example of one that i thought was fabulous but was a fail Thanks, Annette. Yeah, it does. At, at first blush, it sounds great, but yes, the yeah. laws in it when you explain it. Uh, the next question is from Fiona, and it just says, outcomes of parenting are about more than child development, including social capital and community development. How do these outcomes get reflected in the new way of messaging? That's a great point, Fiona. Uh, absolutely, definitely. Um, the, the kind of, that master narrative focuses us into something that stops people from turning off and keeps them engaged because it's that outcome of child development that everybody wants children to thrive. So that's the first point. That navigating waters metaphor is the thing to use next because what that's trying to do is really raise exactly what you say, that parenting is contingent upon the things that happen along the way. So that rough, you know, the children, children thriving, for children to thrive, they kind of need to be on an even keel. Rough waters come along and those rough waters are things like poverty, social stresses, mental health issues. So we need safe harbours to... Uh, like counselling services, uh, financial support, good housing, so that parents are supported. So the, the navigations metaphor tries to do exactly what you're talking about to help people understand, yes, it's about skills, but it's also about context. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, I've got another, there's another question here. Um, sorry, they're moving around on me. Um, um, sorry, we've, the feed's quite quite fast, so my apologies for that. Um, the next one is bringing up great kids as a component on how you were parented. Is this a message to be avoided? I think I think you've actually already touched on that in your presentation. That did you want to respond to that question? Yeah. Look. Um the way you were raised is definitely an important factor. The problem in communicating is that what we found was it was uh, 
the Australian public sees that as the only factor. And the problem with that is that they then think that there's nothing you can do about it. In a, as, as I understand, bringing up great kids is an actual kind of intervention. It's a program. And within a program, when you've got parents in the room, there are all sorts of things you might need to do, including talking about how you were raised. So I don't think in the context of bringing a, up great kids, it's a problem. It would only be a problem if if bringing up great kids failed to then make sure that it was recontextualized. So parent, we're not getting parents to feel blamed and that there's nothing they can do. You know, a lot of people might have been raised poorly, but that doesn't mean to say you're going to be a bad parent because there are a lot of other things that influence parenting. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question here. You mentioned that some um, organisations are already using this kind of um, uh, communications methodology. Have you got any examples at your fingertips that you could share? Uh, yeah, look, I know um, the Centre for Community Child Health have tweeted a couple of uh, reframed messages. The Parenting Research Centre, we've actually changed our messages. We, As I said, we used to talk about um, uh, you know, something like uh, effective parenting, brighter futures. Uh, we've actually turned that around to starting with child development. Uh, I know resourcing parents in New South Wales. Um, I've been talking to Belinda there about uh, starting with child development. Uh, I know some agencies, uh, I was talking to SDN Children's Services in Sydney and they, because they're a, a children's service, they already generally start from the child development frame and then move on. So some people are already using the frame, so we can certainly learn from them as well. There's lots of examples. Um, and in that message memo, uh, sorry, not the message memo, the toolkit, we've got a whole load of examples there. But we're definitely happy to share more of those examples with you. Thank you. Another, are they available on the website? Yes, they're available in the toolkit that you, is on the front page of the Parenting Research Centre website. If you could just give the website address again because a few people are asking for that. Yeah, it's www.parentingrc.org.au. Great. Thank you, Annette. There's been another, there's a, a few questions coming together about um, messaging and communicating with different ethnic and cultural groups, including um, uh, Indigenous Australians, um, and how different metaphors may or may not work in those um, for those communities. Have you, can you talk to that a bit, please? Yeah, uh, look, ju just um, to say that um, we tested the metaphors. It was quite a rigorous process involving uh, a representative sample of 7,000 Australians, uh, and that would have included uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people from different cultural backgrounds, etc. So the metaphor, um, uh, the metaphor held really. The navigating waters metaphor held well, uh, and the child development frame worked. So it worked across cultures, it worked across socio-economic groups, and uh, people with different levels of education. So we would say that the metaphor is strong and resilient um, across cultures and works across cultures as well. Thanks, Annette. And building on that, another question that's linked to that, and I don't know whether you can help us or not, but um, someone says here that you said a metaphor is memorable and contagious. Any tips for developing a metaphor? So I guess what, what, what are the ingredients of a good metaphor that's going to stick? Uh, I, th I think it's, tr it's trying to make it your own, so experimenting a bit, so thinking about uh, what, thinking about a navigating waters metaphor, what does that, that, that you know, there's a boat, uh, there's a keel, um, there's a captain who's kind of, who's doing the navigating, and then there's storms that come along, uh, and the storms can rock the boat, and then we need safe harbours. So I think the thing to do, and what I've been doing, and I know what we've been doing at the Parenting Research Centre, is just trying it out a bit more. It feels a bit clunky at first, um, but with practice, it comes good. And I think, yeah, I think so I think it's practising it, writing it down, the other thing that works quite well is using pictures. So having a picture of a boat, a picture of a lighthouse, a picture of a harbour actually helps you think about what's what's in a bay or a safe harbour. Um, you know, what are the components of that? Great schools, um, you know, places to go, 
it, it all kind of helps bring it together. Um, but we can certainly make sure, I'm just thinking, I know Kelly, our comms manager, is on the line from the PRC. We can certainly make sure we um, highlight some of the things on our website, given these questions as well. Thanks again. Um, there was some, oh, sorry, I've lost the question. <laughs> Something about messages to avoid. Ah, oh, yes. So um, someone's mentioned here that you mentioned eight messages to avoid, but I think people would like you to expand on those. Are you able to tell us those if we promise not to remember them? Lost the sound again. Oh, dear. Ah. Annette, if you can hear me, we've lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you know what? I've got this little button that I keep pressing when I get excited and my arms move around, so sorry about that. Uh, so, what not to talk about? Well, I think what you want to talk about is starting with children. So, one of the things we know to avoid is starting with parenting uh, and effective parenting. So, don't talk about effective parenting or improving parenting or good parenting, okay? Start, start with thriving children, children developing healthily, etc. The other thing to avoid is talking, and what, I know we've done this and the Raising Children Network's done this in the past, and we're, is things like um, talking about, you know, parenting's the hardest job in the world. All parents struggle at some time on their journey, and I'm sure everyone on the line is nodding at this one. Don't do it anymore, avoid it. It's just reinforcing that thinking about, um, uh, well, we might as well give up. You know, there's nothing we can do because it's too hard. So don't talk about the struggle. Don't talk about good parenting, effective parenting, etc. cetera. Um, also, don't use stats that show poor outcomes for children and then argue for parenting support. Explain and use the navigating waters metaphor instead. It just, what we're doing is reinforcing this view that it's deterministic and there's nothing we can do. So we need, People, we need to engage people that there are positive solutions because at the moment the default is there's nothing we can do, so don't invest in parenting support. Uh, and don't start with parenting skills, come to that later. Uh, and don't try and rebut people's ingrained ways of thinking. So don't try and rebut doesn't parenting just come naturally because that kind of forces people into a corner just start with the positive around child development and use the metaphors like brain development about well, what you can actually do. And of course, don't ever talk about evidence-based parenting or the science of parenting with the public. <laughs> That'll really, really turn people off. So explain why parenting matters for positive child development instead. So those, those are some of the really key ones that, um, you know, absolutely jot those down and if all you do is avoid those we'll be moving things forward and then you can really introduce and turn around the more productive ways of talking about parenting. Thank you Annette. Uh, we've had another question here that's a, a beauty and that is uh, where do grandparents fit into all this? Uh, yeah look that's a really good point. Uh, I think um, and remember grandparents would fit into this because the uh, public can, that we interviewed and um, surveyed for this consisted of parents, non-parents, carers and grandparents. So this is a very widely held view which would be held by grandparents as well. And conversely, if grandparents are raising children, um, particularly if they're raising children because uh, their own children are classified as bad parents, it's they are going to feel terribly judged and blamed um, because of what's happening. So again, using these more positive messages and illustrating to, to grandparents the how-to using the brain architecture metaphor and the serve and return metaphor if you're working directly with grandparents is very useful too. But they're as subject to these unproductive ways of thinking as everybody else. Thanks, Annette. I think probably we've got time for perhaps one more question. Uh, and I think this is a cracker. It's come from a midwife. And um, it says, an excellent presentation and a wonderful message. Thank you. Did the study provide any guidance on the best way to help the perennial experts embrace the movement? And perennial, perennial experts is in um, quotes. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a really good point, and I think I think it might um, I think it might go back to that arrow that I showed at the beginning, where uh, if enough of it, uh, what, what the Frameworks Institute says is once enough of us are getting really sick of the navigating metaphor and the um, child development master narrative, that's when we're getting really sick of it and sick of the sound of our own voices saying it, that's when it really starts to take off. And that's when we can overcome some of the experts who might be putting forward a counter message. Um, and it's not necessarily they're coming from a bad place, it's just that they might not yet have been exposed to this new way of communicating. So I guess it's our own advocacy around these issues and uh, making sure that people like the Parenting Research Centre and those of you who are on the line and are drinking the Kool-Aid here are letting other people know about this, this really important new way of communicating about effective parenting and parenting support. Well, thanks again, Annette. We'll, we'll probably wrap it up there. Uh, in fact, we'll definitely wrap it up there. I just want to thank you again <laughs> for the presentation and for taking questions. Um, um, and also a recording of this webinar will be uh, online on the Eracy Paid Members website um, in the next few days. So we invite people to look at that. If you're not a financial member of Eracy, uh, it's worth considering becoming one for the webinars alone uh, for a year will pay for the average individual membership. So um, well worth it. Um, also, we'll work with the Parenting Research Centre to, to try and come up with written responses to anything we haven't been able to cover off today. We'll put those on our website as well, along with the recording of the presentation. Um, so that's, that's it for today. For other ERACI events, we hold a series of webinars and other events. Please visit our website. And on that note, I'd just like again to thank you, Ned, for a really great presentation that's had a lot of interest from people out there, and I think everyone's found very valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye for now.